Okay, welcome everyone. I am Vicky Murillo, the director of the Institute of Latin American Studies and a professor at CIPA and the Political Science Department at Columbia. And it's my privilege to welcome you all to this round table to discuss a new state in Latin America, geopolitical energy and social challenge. And we have an extraordinary panel, which I will introduce <laughs> you to. They have too long uh, uh, series, but uh, many of them you know because they don't teach here. <laughs> So just let me briefly, Luisa Palacios is a senior research scholar at the Center of Global Energy Policy with a multidisciplinary career in the intersection of energy, finance, and policy. She has been the chairwoman of the board of directors of Cisco Petroleum Corporation. And prior to that, she worked at Medley Global Advisors, Berkeley Capital, Societe Generale in Paris, the Japan Bank for International Cooperation, and the World Bank. I have to say that the most important part of, of Luisa's CV is that she got her MA in International Affairs at CIPA. <laughs> that should be mentioned. And, and that, after that, she got a PhD in another institution. <laughs> <laughs> That's not as important. The other institution is the John Hawkins School of Advanced International Studies. Mauricio Cárdenas is Professor of Professional Practice in Global Leadership and Director of the MPA in Global Leadership at CIPA. He's also affiliated at the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy. He's a recognized expert on Latin America and economies with a vast academic and policy making experience, which includes serving as Colombia's finance minister between, between 2012 and 2018. And before that, he was Minister of Economic Development, Minister of Transport and Planning, Mines and Energy. Uh, so a lot of ministries. <laughs> um, he has been twice executive director of Teresa Rosso, which is Colombia's leading policy research center. She was, she was a senior fellow and director of the Latin American Initiative at the Brooklyn Institution, and is also a distinguished fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C., and his PhD in economics is from Berkeley. Martin Guzman is the William Beinecke Visiting Professor at CIPA and co-president of the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia University Business School. And he's also a professor of money, credit, and banking at the Universidad Nacional de la Plata. Martin is a global expert in the field of sovereign debt and debt crisis resolution, who works on the emergency propagation and resolution of macroeconomic disequilibria, monetary economics, and economic development. He served um, the debt health as minister, <laughs> the debt experience health as minister of the economy of the Republic of Argentina between December 2019 and July 2022. Um, he's also a director of the Sovereign Debt Management and Restructuring Program at EPD, and he was the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Globalization and Development. His PhD in economics is from Brown University. We will start the conversation with questions that I will pose to the panelists in the roundtable, and in the uh, later part of the event, we will open to questions from the audience. So welcome Luisa, Mauricio, and Martin for accepting this invitation to discuss the challenges faced by Latin American states. So let's start with the geopolitical challenges. And I have to say, we started before 6.05, which is pretty impressive. You know, my voice does not require a microphone, but you're right, it was off. <laughs> okay. Fine, it's good for the also because this is hybrid. So for the people who are remote, it might be necessary. So let's start with the geopolitical challenges of the new state in Latin America. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, the US attention to Latin America has declined. However, now it seems that there is a new Cold War between the United States and China at the very least. And at the same time, the region is quite far away from areas of conflict. That has been historically the case for much of recent history. And this is true for the war between Russia and Ukraine. This distance allows the region to become a reliable supplier of food, energy, and climate in terms of carbon absorption for the world, where its northern region can also aspire to nearshoring as a result of these geopolitical tensions. So I have a question for the three of you to start our conversation of what are the challenges and the opportunities that this new geopolitical situation opens for Latin America? So why don't we start with Mauricio and come this way? Well, thank you so much, Vicky. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks also for for organizing uh, this uh, this meeting. And I'm delighted to be with Luisa and Martin. Um, 
Latin America has always been the land of the opportunities and the challenges. This has been our history. But now, challenges and opportunities are exacerbated. Um, on the challenges side, Latin America is becoming a difficult region to govern, very difficult re region to govern, because we have increased levels of poverty, and this is uh, essentially the result of the pandemic. The pandemic left the region with uh, scaring effects, one of them, the, the, the increase in poverty. Um, the increase in food prices last year um, resulted in even higher levels of poverty, about two percentage points. Additional debt, public debt had been increasing in Latin America before the pandemic due to the decline and the deceleration in commodity prices, but the pandemic increased public debt even more. Uh, our public debt today is 10 percentage points higher than it was in 2019 in the region and 20 percentage points higher than in 2010. So that means this is a region with more social tensions, more problems to solve and less capacity to borrow. And at the same time, it's not growing. The IMF just had its uh, spring meetings last week, um, actually the week before. The new outlook for Latin America basically saying that growth, it's going to be 2% per year this year and next year, and nothing better the years after. So high debt, high poverty, exacerbated social tensions, and low growth. That's the region that, uh, that those are the challenges that we're confronting today. But at the same time, the opportunities look brighter because a result of, as a result of the global challenges, uh, for every crisis there is in the world, Latin America is, is a, has a potential solution. So we have the climate crisis. Well, Latin America has the biodiversity, the capacity to uh, do the most cost-effective cost way of uh, uh, car uh, capturing carbon. Latin America, we have a food crisis in the world. Well, Latin America has the land, the water, the resources to produce food. Uh, we have an energy crisis and um, the world needs more secure sources of energy. Well, Brazil and Guyana are producing much more oil now than two years ago and are selling that oil to the markets that need that, especially in Europe. Um, and this is a region that this is part of our history that it's, it's that I wouldn't use the word peaceful because it hasn't been a peaceful region. There's been a lot of conflicts. I come from Colombia, so I couldn't, I couldn't say that it's a peaceful region, but it's a region that does not engage in international wars. Those are very, very rare. Uh, we don't use to attack other countries. So is the poster child of the concept of French shoring. I mean, you want to have reliable uh, sources and you want to have uh, um, um, uh, countries that are not going to start a war because they sell you something that is particularly important like food, energy. So that's Latin America. Latin America is a, is a region that is, uh, is trustworthy. So that's, that means opportunities. Every problem in the world, Latin America can be part of the solution. That's, and that's, that's not just a, a cliche, it's, a, it's actually true. So what's going to prevail? The challenges, the low growth, the social tensions, the inability to borrow because debt is already very high, or the possibility of, of, of really taking advantage of these opportunities and getting, getting things right uh, this time. So I think uh, this this is a very interesting, uh, I'm going to stop these inter intro remarks just by saying that um, this is a very exciting time to be studying, um, analyzing, and, uh, and being engaged also in the policy debate in Latin America, because uh, um, this is a, this is done like new, no other in terms of uh, of the, of the magnitude of the problems and, uh, and the opportunities. I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Luisa.
So, um, Vicky, thank you so much for the invitation. I am thrilled to be uh, here with Martin and Mauricio. Um, so I am going to um, talk about uh, two opportunities and then one challenge. Not that these opportunities are the only ones and not that the challenge is the only one, but I'm just gonna concentrate on these two things. The first, more in, in line with Mauricio, Latin American natural resources and its abundant of wealth in terms of natural resources is going to benefit Latin America in this geopolitical world as it has benefited Latin America in the past. We seem to have everything. Uh, uh, every time there's a new challenge, Latin America, as uh, Mauricio is saying, has a solution. Another uh, thing that I think uh, comes to mind when thinking about uh, the question that you ask of nearshoring and friendshoring, as Mauricio defined it, is that Latin America's democracy is a huge asset in this polarizing world uh, in which we find ourselves. Uh, because in this polarizing world, we have um, a, a world that wants, it's not only nearshoring for the sake of nearshoring, but friendshoring means a value-based type of relationship, uh, a, a different way to define our allies. Um, uh, but there's another part of the world that also uh, is more in the global South that defines itself more on a transactional basis. And so the fact that Latin America is in the global South, but it's also more or less, you know, most of our countries are, are, are democracies. I find that a huge asset, not only from the point of view of our values, but from the point of view of being able to navigate the complexities that Latin America is gonna to have to navigate. Uh, our most important investors are uh, the US and uh, the European Union. Our most important market is China. And so, and uh, uh, also Russia represents a, uh, a specific uh, uh, a source of supply of fertilizers in the region. So we, um, this is going to demand a level of uh, maturity and uh, complexity in the way we do foreign policy. Uh, and uh, it's one in which uh, I do think, and that comes to my third uh, point, which is more about the challenges, it's going to demand much more state uh, capabilities, not less. Um, so in confronting with this new ge geopolitical world, it's also new geopolitical challenges from a issues perspective. And so in the geopolitics that are, we're, we're living in, it's also uh, defined by energy transition, climate change, energy security. Um, and while Latin America is both endowed with the old energy and the new energy, it does need to attract a significant amount of resources in order to be able to meet its uh, NDCs or its climate commitments. All of the governments of Latin America uh, committed themselves to a significant reduction in emissions. Uh, most of the next elections uh, are gonna be of governments that are gonna deliver on all of these climate commitments by 2030, starting with the uh, with two, the Mexicans and the Venezuelans are gonna have presidential elections in 2024. Uh, that are going to, uh, and so the next governments are going to have to deliver on those commitments, and that requires a, a significant amount of uh, state capabilities and technocracy in a moment where um, I think we're redefining what that means, and uh, maybe uh, uh, we are not giving the value that we should, we're supposed to give to uh, the uh, ability or, cap or technocratic capabilities or abilities to withstand or, and have uh, uh, solid institutions. Uh, let me leave it there. Martin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Vicky, uh, Mauricio, and Luisa. Uh, Mauricio and Luisa uh, already uh, set the stage of what the main problems in, in particularly in South America, are, uh, which are quite common to different countries in the region in some dimensions and uh, heterogeneous across other dimensions. But what is common is that the region has been suffering from a situation of stagnation. Uh, since the commodity boom uh, was over. For, during the 2000s, we saw significant improvements uh, in terms of social indicators, reductions of poverty, reduction of inequality in a continent that is not the most poor, but it was the most unequal, and it's still the most unequal. But what we didn't see was an evolution of the structures of production, I would say in, every, in virtually every country in the region, that uh, would mean that once the commodity boom was over, uh, economic growth could be sustained. So think of someone who is, say, today 25 years old. Uh, well, that person grew in a continent in which it's difficult to have hope because from, from the, almost for their entire uh, you know, early adulthood, 
that person saw no uh, opportunities in the continent and that has political consequences. So I would say that the most important challenge that the region faces today is to uh, set the conditions for sustained growth with value added, value added and inclusion. Uh, create jobs at large scale that are of better quality than the ones that can be created now. One of the extreme views on how to address the problem of labor that are part of the political debate, and certainly they are part in Argentina, is that given the low levels of productivity for a segment of the population that is in the informal sector, which is about 40%, what's needed as a standard labor reform, like in the 90s, that would create uh, more appropriate conditions for formality. But I don't think that will work because that will, that's not gonna create uh, better jobs. Uh, so ultimately what's necessary and what's needed is to uh, increase the capabilities both of the companies and of the workers. I agree the state uh, capabilities are important and the role of the state is important in this respect in uh, contributing to a more dynamic environment through uh, investments in two critical pillars, knowledge and infrastructure. I think the only way out uh, is with actual increases in productivity, and that requires integration of the continent, but not the kind of integration of acting as a block um, and get, adopting protectionist measures, because those are mostly of a defensive nature. The real integration, the meaningful integration should come through uh, investments in infrastructure. And that of course requires financing. We will speak later about energy. That's where I see one of the most uh, fertile areas for increasing the levels of growth in the continent. Uh, and But investing in infrastructure requires financing. And that's a problem for the continent because on the one hand, uh, private financing is quite unstable. It's true that the geopolitical situation creates opportunities, but it also creates challenges, particularly because uh, of the new global financial environment, quantitative tightening, higher interest rates. This means that there will be less and more unstable uh, financing for the region uh, from the international private sector. And multilateral institutions uh, that are not regional won't provide the kind of financing that the region needs. So that's why I think the, the region needs uh, a stronger uh, regional uh, multilateral development banks. And in this sense, the, the growth of the CAF uh, would be important. Let me move into uh, the geopolitics and a final comment uh, before we also go to the next round. Uh, geopolitics matters uh, and it significantly matters, uh, but even though we do see a change in globalization, a globalization by blocks, if the continent doesn't act as a block, it will have trouble in exploiting the different opportunities that could be created. Uh, we will have a chance to discuss particularly the, the issue of energy, but when it comes to energy, true, there is uh, an increase in some source of demand for a, a, a liquefied natural gas given the, the war in Ukraine. But uh, the most important challenge is to use the uh, uh, energy that the, the continent can produce, particularly the gas that can be produced in order to add value to other sectors of the economy that fertilizers, as Luisa explained, uh, petrochemicals. So the continent needs to move as a block. I truly think that's, a necessary condition for finding a way out of this dynamic of stagnation. Okay, um, this was extremely important. I'm, I'm going to ask a little bit of a follow-up before we move into, into energy. Um, and the reason is that you guys have talked very little about China, right? Which is kind of the elephant in the room that has changed the, the way the, the region operates. Um, and so, I mean, Lisa mentioned China as a market, but China is not just a market. It's a source of finance. Like, you know, you come from Venezuela, you know, it's a big source of finance. Um, and it's not just a source of finance. It allows the countries in the region to play the non-aligned back again. We saw it with Lula's trip to China just recently. Um, so I, I would like to just 
tease you a little bit on this issue of uh, both on the issue of what role plays China in the sense that the democracy seems to be to assume that most Latin American countries are on the kind of democratic or Western, I guess, uh, side, um, with at least the obvious exceptions of, of Venezuela, Cuba, and, and Nicaragua. Um, but at the same time, uh, also with the challenges that have that the region has, and these are more specific questions to Martin, there's been many efforts at creating regional blocks that have failed. To Mauricio, we do not have wars, but we have the highest levels of violence in the world. And so it's not so easy to move uh, logistically from one point to another if you are not going to maybe be alive at the end of the process. <laughs> Um, uh, and again, to Luisa, you said state capabilities, but the kind of the challenge that the region had from its very origins is the state weakness. So it seems that like if you can, the three of you maybe talk a little bit about China and this, and also about these particular issues, and then we move to energy. You want to start in the opposite way? Or the opposite way. Okay, so China. China's presence in, in the region uh, has been growing. The data is clear about that. I mean, China's presence in the entire global South has been growing. And one of the uh, most uh, complex problems today in resolving that crisis is particularly the, is specifically the coordination between China or among China, uh, uh, Wall Street creators and, and uh, the uh, Paris Club creators. When it comes to South America, uh, well, China has been a source of demand for the commodities. Uh, and today uh, there is big interest in lithium and some interest in uh, LNG. This is the kind of conversations that authorities uh, from South American countries, at least from the South Kong, have with uh, Chinese authorities uh, and the uh, Chinese development banks. And China matters also because of finance, as Vicky explained. China provides financing that at times is cheaper than other sources of financing. For instance, China's financing in Argentina is cheaper than the IMF financing, right? That's the world we live in. But China's uh, presence in Latin America has to do with uh, China's interest. That's it. So China is not gonna push the policies that lead to a transformation of the uh, pro productive capacities in the region. China will want the commodities. And true, the region has lithium, and there is potential for value added in lithium, but that's not, not going to be a, a problem resolved. Uh, a, a, the, resol the solution to that problem is not gonna come from China. So the region has to have its own strategies for uh, development. Chinese financing, it's, it's tempting. It has been tempting, especially, especially in a context in which there are lack of alternatives. And also for politicians, is you know Chinese financing. You build a road, you build something that can be seen. Okay, so that that's tempting, but again, the, the financing that China provides, China is not going to finance the electrical grid in the region or the system of pipelines for integration between Argentina and Brazil and the rest of the continent. China provides financing that facilitates transportation of commodities, for instance, so those commodities can be exported at cheaper prices to China and they can be processed there. And, uh, or China can feed its animals with the Argentine soybean. So that's the type of financing. So that's why I think while it's important for the continent, there are obvious reasons why the engagement with China is important, the strategy has to be defined from the continent with financing from the continent. And the uh, second point that Vicky made exactly about that. regional How does the region yeah, operates to exactly. negotiate with China. So when, I, when I refer to integration, I'm not really thinking of a, you know, a common market or that, that's a different kind of discussion. It's a different and it requires different layers. The kind of integration that I want to, that I push for in the near term is through uh, infrastructure. This is a continent. There's no ocean in the middle. There's no reason why electricity couldn't move from Tierra del Fuego, from Suay in Argentina, uh, to the north of Brazil. The problem is lack of infrastructure. And it's the same with gas. And if we had the right infrastructure, there would be in a, a larger scale for production. 
that would mean lower costs of production. And that would mean that our industrial sectors would be more competitive. Okay, thank you, Luisa. So um, when I uh, mentioned China, um, I uh, just wanted to categorize the fact that Latin America has to move in these two worlds. It has to move in the world of French shoring and near shoring, uh, which is becoming a world of, um, uh, uh, of geopolitical uh, uh, assets and liabilities, um, but it also has to move in the transactional world of China. Um, China has been providing financing, but you cannot just live on Chinese financing. It, it actually is not, uh, uh, the, the US and the EU uh, represent something like 40% of the investment needs uh, of the foreign direct investment, according to uh, the UN ECLAC uh, uh, report, last report. Uh, and yes, China represents something like 10 to 15% of the total uh, uh, FDI. So I'm just putting things into perspective, not because I don't think that Chinese investments are not uh, uh, relevant, they are. It's just that Latin America has a very diversified pool of investors. And so, and that's what you want, um, uh, not only from the perspective of sustainable development, is that you need to diversify. If anything we have learned about geopolitics is also the need to diversify your markets and your investors and your creditors. Uh, I think, uh, so in, in, the, in light of that diversification uh, that provides security uh, and provides flexibility and degrees of freedom, um, it's where I think uh, placing, uh, being democracies is a huge asset. You can play in various um, uh, worlds, in various uh, uh, financial centers, in various financial type of investors, um, countries in the region that are actually not democracies have seen those sources significantly decline. And so, and as much as China provides um, uh, low cost of financing, China is an investor as well, and it has been defaulted on. And so being China does not exempt you from the credit issues that the region has. And so you mentioned Venezuela, I can tell you that's the, the example. Uh, uh, so, so much in line with uh, what Martin is saying. Um, so in relation to state cap capabilities, um, you know, I, I think Mauricio and I spend, and some colleagues at CJ have spent quite some time thinking about the financing of the energy transition. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, we have looked at is that uh, financing of the energy transition is also financing of new institutions and financing of state capabilities, because this is hard work and this is difficult. And so um, I am encouraged uh, with the region. I, I think uh, having six countries already with hydrogen maps, and so they are developing green taxonomies, they're understanding what it means uh, to attract capital and attract investment in this new world. And so I, um, I would not push this, uh, um, uh, I will not underestimate our potential. I think this is more about political, if anything, the message that I'm giving is that one of political uh, uh, understanding that uh, state capabilities, technocracy is a strength that should not be undermined because that is what's going to uh, be important in the future to develop all of these markets, to develop hydrogen, to develop even more renewable energy, and even to be able to survive as oil producers. And we're gonna talk about that, but it is as important to survive as oil producers that we understand this new um, markets in which we are operating and they require more, not less state capabilities. Thank you, Mauricio. Well, it's a it's a great follow up because um, we have to bring China into the conversation, and also you asked me about the crime issues. But I I started my comments talking about the challenges and the opportunities, and I think it's fair to say that this is all taking place in a new context, in a new scenario, where the region is more independent. And what do I mean by that? I mean the region has more diversified partners. The world in general wants to be in good terms with Latin America. No, one's, no one wants to pick a fight with Latin America. We're now governed by a group of presidents that are to a large extent left-leaning, but none of them is being ostracized. No one of them is being criticized. They are basically welcome everywhere in the world, including the United States. So what you see is that the region has gained in terms of degrees of freedom to decide, to choose. And, and this is the result of the fact 
that there are two big tensions in the world today. The tension associated with Russia that unites essentially the West, but where Latin America is not necessarily active and taking part of it. President Lula, for example, is distancing from that. And the fight between or the tension between the United States and China. And Latin America is basically absent from that. It's not going to pick sides. And it's taking advantage of the fact that it can actually work uh, with, uh, with all these blocks and, um, and get the most out of it. This is important because this has not always been the case in the region. Um, I think, for example, in terms of the way the IMF approaches the region, uh, there is a reform agenda. Uh, I'm going to use the case of Colombia, uh, trying to change the health system, the pension system, the labor markets. In the old times, and not too long ago, maybe 20 years ago, the IMF would be all over saying whether the reforms were right or wrong, whether they conform or not to the Washington consensus. This time around, they are silent. Colombia is now a member of the OECD. And the OECD is saying that they support the pension reform that finds many critics in Colombia. But the OECD is saying, well, we're not going to take part of it. And we think it's fine. Uh, which is essentially a reform that will give the upper hand to the public sector, to the public fund. But anyway, what I'm saying with this is more degrees of freedom, more capacity to decide, and that can only be good. That has to be a good thing. And, uh, and I think we have that, that opportunity now. So we can, make, we can make good decisions. We can also make mistakes. China is an important factor there uh, because China... Well, it's, it's, uh, it's the most important trading partner for a number of countries, for the majority of countries, in fact, in South America, Colombia, by the way, being an exception. Um, it's an important source of financing. There are many books being written now about the presence of China in Latin America and how Chinese investment has gained ground in terms of uh, uh, public utilities, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth is the region is taking advantage of the fact that there is a market that buys the products from, from Latin America, and that in some cases, not in all cases, been a, an important provider of financing. Um, Martin said, uh, for Argentina, it's lower cost than the alternatives. For a country like Colombia, it's higher cost than the alternatives. So that's why financing from China is relatively limited. But the point is, there is an option there. There is an opportunity, and that's part of the uh, that's 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 one of the advantages. Let's connect this with the issue of uh, of crime. Yes, we do not we're we we're not into international wars, but we do have a fair share of internal wars and internal conflicts and in, in, used to have in the world, and we definitely are outliers in the world in terms of homicides. Uh, Latin America is about eight, nine to ten percent of the world in most variables. Uh, population, GDP, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, it's eight, ten percent. That's that's what we are. We're 22 percent of the crimes, the homicides in the world. Um, so that that means that, the, of course, there is a, that we are allies and there is a there is a problem that has a lot to do with. One of the aspects that I mentioned at the beginning, which is the the, the increased social tensions and the fact that uh, that we are the most unequal region in the world, that we have still very high levels of poverty in some countries, that uh, um, especially that there is no social mobility. I think that's one of the aspects that that, that is more problematic. Um, I mean, that's part of the of the of the challenges, and it also speaks to something that Luisa mentioned, which is low state capacities. I mean. Uh, lack of capacity to to fight and control uh, crime in general and homicides in particular. So these are salient problems of the region. And they will undermine, and I'll stop here, they will undermine our capacity to take advantage of the opportunities. Because that's the question we're here to answer. Is it possible for the region to now transition into, into becoming more developed at a faster pace? Uh, can we basically take advantage of the climb, the energy, the food, uh, the French shoring opportunities, or are these long-standing problems associated with low state capacities going to hold us back? And that's that's the, I think that's the question, and I'd love to get back into this in the 
in the next steps of this conversation. So we're moving to energy and you guys have all mentioned energy already. And the region is a crucial producer of energy and has the potential to grow both in the fossil fuels, but also in terms of the products that are crucial for the energy transition. It's also a region that is crucial for climate conservation. There is like more absorption than emission in the region. And this has been shown in the recent announcement that the U.S. will contribute the Amazon funding and efforts of reforestation in the region. The tension between energy production and environmental concerns, I guess, is most salient in Colombia with the election of President Petro, but I think it's felt at the local level in many countries. So I have a different question for each of you on this area. So let's start with Luisa. Where do you see the current developments of both traditional and clean energy going and, and where could they go? What are the opportunities and how are they linked to these exactly the incentives put by the US, the EU, the China, the, the international incentives. And, and in particular, I would like you to emphasize the Brazil, Mexico, right? The two largest countries in the region and, and, and given their geopolitical weight, how would they deal with these energy challenges? So um, uh, we, we started this conversation talking about the natural resources of, uh, of Latin America. Latin America has both been a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, very well endowed with the energy that produced from fossil fuels, but it's also very well endowed from the uh, renewable energy. Um, um, I was asked recently also a question about where is the region in terms of uh, of the clean energy transition and everything, and my my answer was we are very far ahead. I mean. Latin America, and I always use this number, Latin America's uh, 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 share of renewable energy in its power grid is 60%. The average in the world is 30%. So Latin America is already where everyone else wants to be. Um, and that to me is a huge advantage that talking about the uh, state capabilities, I think we should be you know, made in Latin America. We should be saying every, to everyone, this is made with green energy or clean energy. So it's the cleanest energy matrix as a region. Um, however, not everyone in Latin America uh, is like that. Actually, there are countries in Latin America where you're already at 100%. South America is already over 70%. Because there are many differences. And as you were saying, there's really the region is many energy transitions at the same time. And, and talking about Brazil and Mexico, this is where the it's a twin, uh, the, the tale of two cities. Um, so uh, Brazil is an energy powerhouse in every single aspect you can think of. Um, not only is Brazil already uh, among, it's the eighth largest oil producer in the planet. This is a country that was importing oil like 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, so which tells you, uh, a, a lot about the resource endowment um, uh, helps a lot, obviously, but it's not the only determinant of who gets to uh, attract and who gets to be an uh, uh, energy powerhouse. Um, uh, Mexico used to be one of the largest oil producers, and yet uh, Brazil is producing more than 2 million barrels per day, and Mexico is producing about 1.5 million barrels per day. And so Mexico used to be, along with Venezuela, the largest oil producer, and now uh, uh, they are, they're not. Uh, it's Guyana and Brazil. Um, and so um, the other thing about, uh, about uh, Mexico is that while Brazil's energy matrix is more than 70, 75, in some cases 80%, depending on whether there's El Niño or La Niña, um, of renewable energy, Mexico actually is a laggard. Um, Mexico's uh, 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 dynamics in terms of the energy transition look very much like the rest of the world. In fact, it's uh, uh, probably lower than the global average. Um, so uh, Mexico's share of non-fossil fuels uh, in its totally, total uh, uh, um, uh, power mix is less than 30%. Um, and when we count just uh, renewables and hydro, it's about 25%. So, so actually, uh, 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 Mexico is one of those stories that we think, oh, Latin America, everyone has hydro, it's super renewable. No, not, not actually, not Mexico. Um, and that tells me a lot about uh, the, the political economy of the energy transition. 
because state ownership of oil resources in Brazil is not hindering the energy transition. The energy powerhouse story that I'm telling you about Brazil is coming all together. Uh, um, and Brazil is developing its green hydrogen in the south, in the north of the country. It's also a biofuel powerhouse. It's trying to develop biomass. Uh, Petrobras has one of the lowest uh, uh, low carbon uh, uh, crews out there. So it's trying to develop everything at the same time without this uh, being a zero sum game. That's not the case of uh, Mexico. Uh, in Mexico, the politics of the energy transition has meant that this, this is a zero-sum game. Uh, and the state has actually, the incentives of the state has been to not uh, accentuate or not uh, uh, accelerate uh, the uh, deployment of clean energy technologies because it goes against the market share of the state. And so how do we, how do we, um, how does Mexico manage that given that it's part of a, a uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Mexico uh, uh, Canada trade uh, free trade agreement, uh, and it has to be part uh, of the uh, French shoring. Also means being continuing to be part of the supply chains, and so Mexico. Uh, uh, you know, you have announcements of uh, electric vehicles uh, uh, by some of the uh, automobile uh, companies. These automobile companies are going to demand more clean energy from Mexico because then there's a life cycle emission problem that you're making it in electric vehicles, but you're making it with fossil fuels. And so demands for Mexico in terms of its man being a manufacturing powerhouse are going to actually mean that Mexico's pressure to develop more renewables is, is going to increase, not decrease. But right now what you have is that Latin America attracts more or less about 4% of the total clean energy uh, uh, investments in, in globally. That's really not a lot but most of it is going to Brazil. So Brazil is doing something right. Uh, the thing is, is that in Latin America, energy transition is not necessarily the same thing as meeting climate goals, in part because uh, the region, uh, the energy sector is not where the emissions are uh, or not where the bulk of the emissions are. Uh, in the region, and, and uh, Mauricio can talk about this as well, it's land use and deforestation, which is uh, the agricultural sector that is uh, as important, if not more important than the energy sector. So energy transition in Latin America, while it's extremely important, it's really not enough. You, it doesn't even get you halfway to meeting uh, climate goals. Thank you very much, Martin. So let's follow with you and then we'll, we'll go back to those issues in the question to Mauricio. So you talk about integration and pipelines. And so what is the role of energy integration in, in, in the way you see development strategies for the region, which seem evident in the prior answer? And in particular, if you look at South America, the Mercosur countries, but beyond the Mercosur countries, what impact do you think such integration would have and how feasible it, it would be? Because it's not just the question of, of building the pipelines and, and building the networks, but also of countries that sometimes cut the supply through those pipelines and through those networks. I mean, we know this by experience um, and change prices, their agreements, and then their changes in prices, or sometimes these agreements are imposed. I mean, if you think of Paraguay and Brazil on terrible conditions for one of the countries. So, I mean, there is a, a long history that has been complicated on this issue. Great questions, Vicky. So uh, I don't think there is anything as transformational as uh, the integration of the energy sector in South America, as transformational for the entire continent, and, and specifically for, for Argentina. Uh, it helps on multiple fronts. So if there was more integration, if we could make energy, gas and electricity fully tradable in the continent, that would lead to an increase in the scale of production and that would decrease the cost. What's important is that that decreasing cost translates into a decrease of the prices of energy. And if that happens, that improves the balance of payments for the countries that still need to import energy and that could export energy. So that makes the macro better. That improves the fiscal side. Especially, especially for the countries that today are subsidizing the energy, because you know you need less subsidies if the cost is lower, and that also changes the competitiveness of the industries. The energy is a critical cost 
in the structure of production of an economy. So cheaper energy means a more competitive economy. Of course, it would be good for the region to first uh, use as much of that uh, potential increases in, productions, in production of gas to uh, for uh, adding value within the continent. As I said before, you know, the pet petrochemical industry, uh, fertilizers, and then the rest export, uh, and, and if it can be liquefied, export to the rest of, of the world. The development of the energy sector also provides more resilience. It makes the region safer from an international politics viewpoint. As you said, Vicky, energy policy is not just economic policy. It's also foreign policy. It's foreign policy for getting to the point of deeper integration, but also for managing that integration. And in this sense, the continent doesn't seem still to be mature enough for addressing the challenges, but this is what I would expect to, see, the, the kind of political discussion that would be good to see over the next few years as soon as possible. There are challenges for each country that come from a integration of our energy systems. Uh, let me give you an example. Let me illustrate these challenges and these tensions with uh, what's going on in Argentina today. Uh, the country is building a pipeline that is going to connect the south of the country with the, a gas pipeline, right? With the north of the country, it's going to make gas tradable within Argentina, which is not yet. And it will allow for trade with Brazil. So what are the two main concerns? What happens if now gas becomes a tradable good between Argentina and Brazil, and the price in Brazil is higher than what we see today as the domestic price of Argent in Argentina? And you know, once if, if it, there is not appropriate regulation, why would companies sell at the current prices in Argentina when they can sell at the higher prices in Brazil? There will be a conversion to one price. And if the price of energy, rather than decreasing, increases, that leads to deindustrialization rather than industrialization. And it also creates a, a adverse uh, a distributional consequences. There are distributional consequences within the continent and within countries. So this is an aspect that will have to be managed. And the role of the state for that uh, is going to be important. Finally, renewable. Renewable is important, not just from the viewpoint of economic development, it's also important from the viewpoint of macroeconomic stability. In a world of car with carbon pricing, countries that don't adapt their structures of production will face com more, more problems of uh, uh, competitiveness. And that again, that affects the macroeconomy. It affects the balance of payments. Let me conclude by saying that even though the financial situation, the financial conditions in the region are not the most favorable, and we are going in the direction that we all see through quantitative tightening and the increases in the interest rates by the Fed, the ECB. Still, with the same financial conditions, there is important upside that will come from the integration of the energy sectors, because the main bottleneck today is the infrastructure. Thank you, Martin. Mar Mauricio, I, I really, uh, I think we're going to go to Colombia in part because it seems to be a crucial test for the tensions between, I mean, that, that, that Luisa mentioned, right? It's not just the energy transition, what causes the issue of, uh, of climate change in Latin America is the use of land, is deforestation. We've seen that in the Amazon. There seems to be also a tension here, distributed tension between short-term demands that could be satisfied by producing more fuel income, uh, you know, income coming from oil and gas, and this long-term vision that there should be not just an energy transition, but a, a decrease in 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 the in the increase of in the increasing uh, temperature of Earth. 
Um, and this is something that President Petro has really made a big deal about it in his election. This seems to be a tension within Colombia and even within the administration of President Petro. So I would like you to, to reflect on these tensions, on how can they be solved, and what are the lessons that Colombia could have for other countries in the region, which also face a similar circumstances. I mean, we can think of Peru, we can think of Ecuador. I mean, it's not the only country. It's the country that's kind of leading the conversation, if you want. Sure. Well, um, I don't know about the lessons, but uh, <laughs> sure, I can try to help um, understand what's uh, what's going on but let me let me begin where uh Luisa ended which is we I as I said before we have eight percent of the global emissions eight percent of the global population eight percent of the global GDP which means our per capita or per unit of GDP emissions are pretty average nothing special uh where we are special, is in terms of the composition. And this is already you know, well known uh, for the world in general, the majority of the emissions, maybe two thirds of the emissions are related to energy use um, and just one third to agriculture and changes in land use. Well, in the case of Latin America, it's just the opposite. The, the biggest chunk of emissions is associated <laughs> with agriculture and with changes in land use. Just, you know, just let's put a, a, a name to this, deforestation. That's basically the reason why there are uh, emissions in, in, in our part of the world. Um, preventing deforestation should be, you know, uh, and avoiding emissions should be very easy, right? Should be, I mean, with all, with all the technology, plant trees, and that will basically reduce a uh, uh, emissions and would actually help solve the problem of the world by doing more carbon capture. So it's a technology that is simpler than the technologies that are available in other sectors. But it is very difficult to do this. And it's very difficult because um, it requires a lot of capabilities that uh, states need to have in terms of verification, monitoring, what are you going to do with the population that typically is very, uh, very marginalized, very poor, displaced population that are engaged in this type of activities, many of them illegal, like illicit drug production or illegal mining. So it basically needs the, the, the a, a state, I'm not going to use, I'm, I won't use the word strong because this is not necessarily about enforcement. It's also a capable state, a state that is able to tell uh, citizens, um, uh, you can move into these other sectors, you can earn income by doing this other, uh, by, by engaging in other type of activity, including environmental services, like protecting the environment. So it, it really requires a lot of uh, state capacities to, to be able to uh, solve these, uh, these problems. So then the question is, and this in connection with uh, Vicky's point is, well, our states have been organized around the idea, and this is part of the problems that we need to solve, of extracting rents from commodities. And let's use the example of oil exporting countries like Venezuela, Mexico, Colombia, uh, Brazil, Ecuador. Um, so the states have essentially been formed around, and this goes back five centuries, of ensuring that these uh, activities are uh, protected, um, that uh, they can operate, and that they also provide rents to the government. And then the, the government is, is, uh, is a technology that redistributes those rents, um, in, in some cases better than in others, but in, the sense, in essence, it's about the redistribution of that. So that, that state and the state that has been built around the national oil companies is not the state that is instrumental in reducing the problems of deforestation. It's a different state. So if we really want to do that, we have to redirect the state and we have to think in, in different terms. And also, is not just about the state and the state capacities, it's also about developing the market. 
um, developing a market for the carbon credits. So this is a market that has a lot of failures. Um, it's not easy to, it's not deep enough, it's not liquid enough, has many problems. So this is not gonna happen overnight. This is gonna take time. No matter how much we think this is the way to go, to countries like Colombia, Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, all the countries that have uh, Venezuela, strong presence in the Amazon, we're gonna start selling carbon credits and we're gonna make basically the revenues that we were making in the past with oil. That's the concept, but it, that's gonna take time because it requires the development of a market that doesn't exist uh, and then also requires a, a different state. So what is the question? The question is, how do you do the transition? How do you go from point A to point B? Is it by deliberately saying you want to reduce rapidly oil exploration, gas exploration, mining, because that's what's going to push you in the direction of really um, engaging in activities that will reduce emissions, that will allow you to find these other sectors like reforestation or afforestation, et cetera. In other words, is a shock therapy the best treatment? Or should you go in a way that is more gradual? And this is the debate that is taking place in Colombia. This is not between the deniers and the people that believe in climate change. This is not about whether you think it's a, it's a, it's a right objective to reduce emissions, to contribute to the world goal of reducing uh, the increasing temperatures. That's not the debate. It's a debate about how to do this. And, uh, and uh, I guess it's the, it's the, uh, the, the tension between uh, the shock therapy and the gradualism. Um, I am in the camp of gradualism because I think that the shock therapy will leave us with the inability to have the resources to invest in this transition. And this transition, this transition requires investment because you need to develop uh, capacities. You need to develop income for alternative income for the marginalized populations that live on deforestation. It requires revenues. So I think we don't have any unfortunately we don't have we don't have too many alternatives at this stage different than uh the rents from oil and mining but this is this is a this is a political debate let me end this with um with uh with a comment on um the um the the nature of the conversation because you you alluded to this the nature of a conversation with the us um the idea that the U.S. is going to provide $500 million for, for the Amazon announced last week by President Biden, et cetera, et cetera. So there are two models here. The model of the donors aid um, that uh, countries provide uh, or even uh, philanthropists provide so you protect land. Or the model that you go through the market that you sell the carbon credits so that they help offset emissions in other sectors, in other parts of the world. So the market is taking really the, 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 the growth is in the market. It's not in the aid part. So it's also about that concept. Um, and I think uh, to your point about President Petro, I think Petro is still thinking in terms of the, of the model of aid. The world has to pay us, has to, uh, the, the, the word that is used is compensate us for this. Um, we didn't admit historically, the advanced economies did that. So they have to give us the money so that we protect. I think the solution to this problem is gonna go through the market. It's not gonna be through aid. It's not gonna be through uh, donors. It's, it's going to be through um, selling the carbon credits. And this is if the advanced economies are serious about carbon pricing. And I think that's uh, that's a trend we're seeing. So I'll stop here. So let me build on that. And, and I have to say that carbon prices are certainly low, lower than the opportunity cost that planting anything in the Amazon, right? And, and, and it's not just, uh, you know, population on illegal activities. If you look at the Chaco, if you look at the Amazon, this is legal soybean production, which produce a lot of revenue for the states as well. So it's, it's a tension there. 
And, and, and it's important because planting trees actually do, does not produce the same level of carbon than the original forest. So it doesn't produce the same effect. What really should be happening, it's either with carbon markets or with aid, we can discuss what's the, the right way, uh, is that deforestation is a stop before it happens because people are paid the, the, the opportunity cost. And so, but there's no not much of that happening, right? The countries that are not exploiting are not being benefiting in any way for that. And, and I think this bring us to this idea of the tensions of the social challenges of the region. That's why I, I thought of soybean, which you know is the main cause of deforestation in Argentina and the main source of fiscal revenue for the government. So there's little incentive to prevent deforestation there. So Latin America is the region with the highest levels of inequality, although it's not the poorest region in the world. During the commodity boom, as, as Martin mentioned, poverty decline, inequality decline, informality decline, are still at very high levels. But since the economic growth stopped with the end of the commodity boom, not only there was no alternative uh, uh, solution in terms of economic growth, uh, but also the social indicators stopped improving, in some cases declined with the pandemic, certainly they declined. Social discontent was very high in the region before the pandemic. I mean, the last panel we had in person before the pandemic was on the upheaval that was moving through the region. We had the 2019 uh, social explosion in, in Chile, in Colombia, the, the, the strike in Ecuador, the mobilization of the indigenous people in Bolombia. I mean, every country in the region. Uh, and, and it's interesting, Chile and Colombia that were kind of oasis or perceived as very macroeconomically stable were two of the countries that saw uh, the most uh, discontent. Uh, so this, there seems to be a discontent with the way democracy works among the population. And that's higher, I mean, at, according to service, among those in the informal sector, although that's not very surprising. And I think this discontent is something that both left and right governments are facing in the region. Um, and, and, and it seems hard to ask the population to wait for more. I mean, the, the, these people have been waiting since the transition to democracy, which happened like 30 or 40 years ago, depending on the country. And they're kind of short term, but it makes sense that they're short term because they, they've already had waited for a long term. And so their patience with the political elites and with their technocrats telling them to wait seems to be very short. So I have two questions that are for uh, each of you. Um, so first is given these challenges, what are the key policy priorities for establishing a path towards inclusive growth or sustainable growth, however you want to call it, that addresses the social debt for these large segments of the population? All of you have mentioned natural resources, even an in infrastructure. But that's not going, even the, the knowledge economy, that's not going to provide the levels of jobs that you need for the region. So I guess uh, I, we'll start like at the beginning again, and then okay. the second question. Well, you you have to, it's a, it's a great question. It's a big question and many interesting topics there. So you probably have to cut me. Um, okay, look, got you. <laughs> we, we, uh, 20 years ago, there was this idea that, um, there will be no long-term gain without short-term pain. So you had to do things that were costly. You had to reduce the fiscal deficit dramatically so that that would be kind of like the seed of growth. This, the, the, what will allow you to improve things later. Short-term pain, long-term gain. With the tensions that we see in Latin America today, that's it's not a viable proposition with this, with the social unrest. The use of this fourth power, the power of the street, that it's so dominating, it's impossible to start proposing reforms that begin with, uh, we're going to make things worse now for the short term, and then things are going to improve. So we need to start thinking in terms of the policies that are necessary. Um, in a way that are consistent with the idea that um, that uh, we cannot make the population worse off, even in the short term, because then governments will be kicked out. Second observation here. Um, so 
given the previous uh, discussion, we kind of like think, well, in, in Latin America, this is not so much about the energy transition, it's more about the climate transition. So we need to uh, think in terms of, of uh, reducing emissions. We already talked about deforestation and agriculture, that's very important, but let's not ignore the energy part. So we are developing the renewable energy, the, the unconventional renewables. We, we had hydro for, for decades, but we're now doing solar and wind, and that's kind of like being extended into the idea of developing hydro, et cetera. So how should we go about this? We need to bring in, in the conversation, something that has been very absent in Latin America, historically. I mean, it was important in the mid 1950s, in the middle of the, of the 20th century. We need to bring back industrial policies. In, in many sectors in Latin America, this is not well received. But without industrial policies, it's going to be impossible to not just develop these new sources of energy, but use them in a way that will allow us to grow faster, will allow us to generate the incomes that we need. So we need industrial policy. We're not used to that. And we need to start thinking in terms of industrial policies, for example, to be able to promote the uh, hydrogen, the ammonia, to uh, use the clean sources of energy to produce green cement or green steel. Essentially, this could be the cornerstone of the reindustrialization of Latin America, but a green reindustrialization. But our states do not think in those terms, at least I haven't been used to do that in the last 20 years. So we need to, and this is, this is, this is something that requires a lot of skills. And it also requires, um, it, it requires resources. Think of what's happening here in the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act. It's been very successful. There are you know, news all over the place saying that the amount of investment that is taking place, yes, but it's very costly at the same time. There's a lot of money from the government in terms of tax credits and in terms of uh, subsidies and expenditures. We don't have that capacity. In Latin America, we cannot do whatever it takes. We can do whatever we can, which is much, much less than whatever it takes. So we have to be very selective. Is it hydrogen? Is it ammonia? Is it green cement? Is it uh, <clears throat> steel? But we need to we need to do that. We need to go that extra mile and um, and um, and think in terms of uh, of industrial policy. So I'm going to end with this. We need a different state. That's part of the problem. To be able to 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 take advantage of these opportunities, all these opportunities. It's not the old state. The state that was built around the extraction of rents from the oil and mining companies. Uh, through the national oil companies. No, we need a different state because we need a state um, that uh, that is going to require very different uh, capabilities. We need to be able to develop the carbon credits market. We'll need to be able to develop these uh, industrial sectors uh, to be able to use uh, um, uh, clean energy. Um, I think clean energy, the advantage for us is not to bring it from Patagonia to Alaska. That, that's, it's not, that's not going to do the trick because the U.S. is also going to produce clean energy. It's going to do it very cheaply. What we need to is make sure that we transform that green, clean energy into products, and that we're and that we become uh, important suppliers of those products. Be uh, in the uh, uh, batteries for electric vehicles, be it uh, hydrogen. Uh, you know, each country can make a decision. It's going to have to be selected, but we need to bring back that into into the equation. Lisa? Um, so this is a quite a broad question. Um, the energy transition discussion is coming alongside um, uh, the discussion about sustainable development goals. It's coming alongside the discussion about just transition and environmental justice. So my, my sense is that what Mauricio was saying is that um, this is not an agenda uh, that you can just navigate through it without also uh, showing uh, uh, how is it that you're dealing with uh, with these issues. And I and I say that because I think this also um, is going to be uh, it's going to demand of Latin American states a different way to think also about rents. Um, and you uh, mentioned uh, uh, that Latin American states see energy 
as a source of rent and uh, and we have to the energy transition sees energy as a source of development and you're talking about industrialization um one of the i think one of the things happen that happens as well with uh, uh uh you know extractive industries of which we have oil and gas but we also have critical minerals and mining is um the concept that when you're extractive you have really uh, um, you have not thought really about community development and and that's part of uh, things uh, like ESG uh, sustainable development goals what is it that you're doing uh, 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 for your community and uh, how are you integrating your community in the way you are now doing uh, and, and uh, developing these resources and this has become such an important discussion I, you know, I follow ESG and I follow ESG ratings and disclosures and everything. And when I look at the extractive industries and the ESG components on the S part that are material for mining, for agriculture and for oil and gas, community relations is one of them. Um, and so because they, uh, it has uh, become so intertwined with the way we produce. Um, and so that tells me that um, we probably need a different uh, social contract um, in the way we do mining extraction in Latin America, because this idea that is just flowing to uh, um, the states or the government, and this is the formula in which this amount of rent goes to this, I, I think that uh, companies uh, uh, and local communities uh, it's going to be very tough to develop the critical minerals and mining uh, resources that we need uh, for the energy transition without a, a completely rethinking how are we going to develop this in a way uh, uh, that allows a social license to operate. So in thinking about the social dimension, the energy transition uh, uh, and uh, how uh, it's changing the way we think about things and ESG just changing the way we think about things is also demanding that. Of the of the people that are producing, and it is as as uh, important as as questioning the social license to operate, uh, and so that means that companies have to do much more, which means that the governments have to uh, receive less friends. Uh, and so overall, I, I think that's one of the most important challenges. How how do we transition this state from a state that just extracted and decided how to distribute to to a state that um, allows communities and social development to occur alongside the energy transition hubs or the uh, carbon offsets, for example. Carbon offsets is, the, uh, um, is, is one that you were mentioning. The carbon offsets is all about local communities and uh, uh, discussing with the uh, municipalities, how do we uh, 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 you know, have rents for um, or revenues for, for the whole community to safeguard different areas. So, the whole the whole discussion, uh, I think, uh, uh, could lead to a different way of how we think about social policy, in which it's not only the government, the central government that does social policy, but everyone in the chain of command, everyone in the st at the state level, even companies, and that takes me to another point, which is. Energy transition and climate change are demanding a different way of how we think about states and markets, um, and I don't know uh, that we have that completely sorted out in Latin America. The state cannot do everything. Uh, uh, and there has to be, in some places, uh, the state is the one that extracts oil. In other places, it has to be joint ventures with the private sector. In other places, it has to leave the private sector to do things. And so how, how is that state going to develop and uh, evolve? It's not, not clear. But that's one, I think, one of the challenges of, uh, of managing the transition. And lastly, um, from a social standpoint, Managing the energy transition also means an orderly energy transition. It is the responsibility of the states to provide um, a, a reliable and secure energy. And that's why also energy transition comes with uh, access to energy and access to clean energy. Um, um, and that requires a lot of pragmatism of how you move from one place to the other. And it requires energy redundancy, uh, which is part of, uh, I think the discussion in Colombia is, is how do you do a smooth and orderly transition also has to do with, we're going to have to coexist with all the sources of energy until we can completely move to one place to another, because it is, um, it is part of the way we, we have to do social policy. Energy is the most important basic service that you have. And I'm coming from a country where that uh, used to be something that the population had and it's no longer the case. Energy reliability is 
so important for low-income uh, population, having reliable energy where you can store food and it doesn't go rotten because there are blackouts. Uh, this is so, so such an important factor in how you think about energy transition and energy reliability that, uh, that I think that it needs to be entered enter the discussion about social uh, policy. Thank you, Martini. Um, okay, Vicky, so the, your, your question about how, how to uh, implement policies in democratic countries, you are the political scientist, so <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> perhaps you could help us with this. Um, but certainly on the economic side, we, we had some discussion already, uh, and what's clear is that the, the continent needs more dynamism, and in that sense, I don't think that can be achieved without uh, industrial policies. The, the issue of energy policies and knowledge policies that they affect the entire uh, structure of production, the, the trade sector and the non-trade sector, there are forms of industrial policies that can make a difference. But I, I think your question is, uh, or at least part of your question uh, is about politics. And we can have any program we want, but at the end, what matters for the success of any program is the support, uh, I mean, the, poli the, the political capacity, which is given by the support of the population. And we live in a continent that faces much tighter constraints today than 15 years ago. And that matters for politics. It's difficult to create enthusiasm with any program, precisely because constraints are tighter. And it's also difficult to see, as a consequence, the kind of representation that implementation of economic policies requires. So we see more political fragmentation. Look at what's happening in the continent. We live in a, in a continent of coalitions, Colombia, Chile, Argentina, even Brazil, et cetera. And a, war, a continent with governing coalitions in which it's so difficult given the constraints to offer something that guarantees a, a political success over the medium term that we see more conflict. And also, unfortunately, and this matters for the economy, we have seen over, it depends on every country is different and we should make this clear, but in some countries we have seen uh, secular increases in, in conflict domestically more polarization. And that affects the entire exercise of uh, public policy making. Because when there is that, when you reach those levels of conflict, politics becomes an instrument for survival rather than an instrument for transformation. And that really disturbs uh, public uh, policies. So, I think we need leadership is important. We need to act within the constraints we face. That's just a reality. It's, it can, it's an inescapable reality and we need to transform those constraints. And uh, when we see problems of representation, my view is that the people should, should resolve those problems. Today in Argentina, when we have, there is a public debate about this. This is a year of presidential elections. And, um, there are different views on what should happen in the process towards the election of a president. I think uh, we should let the people decide who represents the people. There should be electoral competition uh, at the level of the primary elections, because that's what will strengthen uh, the democracy. And that's a process that can lead to new leaderships and therefore find the right conditions for implementing any program that could be implemented. So let, I think we should open to questions from the audience, but just uh, let me say, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, as the political scientists in the table, I mean, there are issues that the state has to take on. So for instance, ESG, I see as a political scientist as problematic in the sense that, you know, one thing is to tax and to decide how the money is expending. And the other thing is to have private actors deciding how the money is spending, especially given that in many countries, the constitution 
have a special right to natural resources. It's not like the US that if you find oil in your background, in your, you know, in your home, it's yours. So it's it's not exactly uh uh it generates tensions and, and what I've seen is that it operates the best where the state is absent. So the people is happy to have the company take charge where the state wasn't doing anything anyways. Um, but I think you, the three of you have touched on, on, on things that are important from a kind of political science point of view that I just wanna mention them while I think about them. Um, and I open to, to other comments and questions. One is this idea of the long term versus the short term that Mauricio uh, mentioned, and the extent to which there is uh, a potential for, for, a, for a, a, a path to economic growth. I, I know you guys kind of skip my, uh, the answer to my question, but uh, when you mentioned the commodity boom, the commodity boom was basically exploiting natural resources, but those resources were not. Uh, you know, guided toward thinking about, oh, the prices of commodities may come down and we'll still need to provide, right? So there is no a, a real strategy there. And so in that sense, I understand the skepticism of the population of all countries because we thought we were going in a good place. We thought, you know, maybe I'm not good, but my children might be better. And suddenly, no, it didn't work. So why am I going to believe this time? And, and I think, you know, there should be a past that like shows them that their children at the very least will be better off for them to trust again. I mean, it's not just a question of choice. I think there is choice in many countries, but there's also a question of credibility over those choices. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, I, I really like the, you know, it's interesting when we talk a lot about energy, but there was both the, the question of cost that's a very dramatic one. And the question of reliability, those are two things that people want when like, you know, voters want when you think about energy. And, and they really, uh, the idea of welfare, I think is what's behind that, right? That's that's what's in ultimately in the, in the mindset of voters. The idea of having, you know, basic ideas of welfare, which include, include both not to be killed, so security, and to have like sufficient for their families. I don't think voters are particularly uh, dramatic in the way they think from anyone else. But I think we should provide kind of a, a long-term prospect for them if you want them to believe in whatever support coalition. The fact that we don't have those ideas maybe explains the fragmentation that we see that politicians who do not have those ideas end up having short-term incentives to fight each other. So let me uh, get back to the audience and open for questions and comments. See you. You want the microphone? And please introduce yourself for those people. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Sekiguchi. Thank you very much. Uh, revisiting that both at a domestic and at the international level, the reliability. Uh, Domestically, because there are different governments, they have different views and they can change uh, the rules and that whatever the merits conspires against uh, investment and that's internalized. And internationally, uh, the question about shutting the valve and not exporting here or changing the prices, are there institutional arrangements that can be done both domestically and internationally Two, while of course uh, respecting the sovereignty that's irreductible uh, of a country, can also increase reliability or uh, or limit uh, the discretionality of uh, further changes. Thank you very much. So let me take some other couple more questions and then get back to yes. Hi, my name is Jana. Um, my question is uh, regarding growth models, and uh, it's maybe a very uh, development economics focused question. Uh, so I, I've heard uh, that you think about industrial policy, and I was wondering how much um, we still think about the models that have been around for the last 30, 40 years, or even longer, which are um, catching up governing markets, um, jumping up the value chain. How much is that still relevant in the way we think about uh, growth models and how much do we um, maybe have new ideas or um, 
that I've heard uh, in the discussion in the US and also in Europe, which is around uh, supply side uh, progressivism um, and how does it relate to maybe a discussion between the left and the right uh, in Latin America? Thanks. Hi, my name is Ben. Uh, I'm a first year MIA student here at SIPA. I thought uh, what you were saying on industrial policy was very interesting. And when I think about um, industrial policy uh, in the energy sector in Latin America, I think of Mexico's energy mix and I think about the issues uh, with all of the state involvement and management of, um, of, of firms there. So I was sort of wondering if you could sketch out um, what would need to be done uh, for industrial policy in the energy sector um in latin american countries in the future to be effective in really achieving its aims so for example um what would uh, a future chilean uh national uh, lithium company uh look like if it were to be effectively managed uh grow the economy and benefit uh the local population as it should thank you we have one more okay Mada, and then we give you okay Yes, hi, Luciana Gala. Um, my question is about Trump uh, political. Uh, uh, Mauricio mentioned at the beginning that he thinks that uh, Latin America is kind of neutral to, you know, the West and East uh, uh, debate. But Lula was in China last week and mentioned that uh, the de-dollarization de is a priority for his government, that he doesn't understand how the international trades are done in dollars, is still in dollars, that uh, he thinks that the US stimulates the war between Ukraine and, and Russia and is flirting with Putin for a closer relationship. How do you see that for the region, considering that Brazil is the biggest economy and so how do you see that just a, a populist silly president talking uh, nonsense or you think that this could bring real consequences to the region thank you okay so let's give it back to the panel you can choose which questions you uh, how would you you want to start luisa you never started so why don't you start <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not going to answer all the questions. I'm, I'm just I'm going to um, <laughs> I'm going to pick um, uh, uh, going to pick two. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the Chilean uh, uh, easy one, uh, uh, the Chilean uh, National Lithium Company. Um, there is a reason um, why a lot of countries in Latin America, national companies, benefited uh, the exploitation of oil versus gas. Um, and there's a reason why Russia uh, uh, did not shut down the gas and not the oil. Um, the oil rents are much higher than the gas rents. And so what I'm getting at is the rents coming from critical minerals uh, are not clear that they can, uh, this is not necessarily a nuco delico, right? So it's, this is not an easy one uh, because it's not necessarily, it's not gonna provide you with, uh, with the same level. It might not provide you with the same level of rents. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The second thing is that all the nationalizations that happened, uh, uh, except for a very few ones, but most of the nationalizations that happened historically in the oil and gas sector, which was the first extractive industry, were done after there was significant investment of international companies that already had developed the technology and the capacity and had invested significant amount of resources um, because nationalizations happen normally when already the industry is developed. Um, um, it's very rare, although it has happened, uh, politically it makes no sense, but uh, it has happened that you nationalize uh, an industry in the exploration phase because you're not facing really rents. And the, and the theory behind the history about nationalizations of extractive industry has to do with the state wanting to capture most of the rents. So. It's it's very it's a tough one to be um, uh, uh, to be uh, on the lithium side. You do have lithium production in uh, in Chile. That there are companies that do have lithium lithium production. Um, uh, it makes more sense to me if you definitely are going to have a state agency involved in lithium to do something like the Norwegians developed for the oil and gas uh, sector, and not necessarily what only Equinor did, but the Norwegians, which was replicated by the Brazilians. Um, developed a national agency that it was really 
function like a portfolio holding um, in which the agency, what it had is a stake, an equity stake in the development of that resource. Um, and so you conduct the bidding rounds and the bidding rounds, uh, uh, you, you, some of the criteria or, uh, in some cases is how much of the equity stake are you willing to give that government agency? So what the government agency ended up being is like a state venture capitalist or, or something like that in which it did not have direct operations uh, um, into, into the, uh, uh, the, the resource. And so, um, it does seem that extractive industries, the history of the extractive in this industries is that you end up develop uh, you know, state companies. Uh, um, uh, and if you're going to think about uh, doing that, I think the best way to, to do, not that I'm recommending it, but the best way to do that is a way in which you do not hinder the development of the industry. Uh, so how do we think about this, that the state does get the rent? Uh, as my, but without hindering its development and its uh, future production. So that's how I would think about, about that. Uh, the, the second thing, um, but I'm not going to answer in a very uh, uh, satisfactory way, David, uh, um, is about relative, uh, the contracting part. Uh, one of the problems, um, political risk in Latin America, is when you export what you consume. Um, that is a formula for... Uh, changing contracts, uh, uh, you know, export controls, and 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 I think Argentina has a, has long experience with with these kinds of things. And so, um, it's the history of the natural gas industry, it's the history of uh, the beef industry. So, um, but it's not only that; it's in many countries. It is it is the same um, the same dynamic. So, uh, um, and so I think that uh, one difficulty is to develop contracts that can withstand domestic pressure when, when you do not have a significant surplus capacity. Uh, that, that's a tough one. Uh, 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 so not sure, not sure I can answer that for, it's, it's a risk and it's a risk that has to be built into contracts. To me, more about, okay, force majeure. So knowing that this country significantly consumes that in which I am exported for of, so how can I develop compensation mechanisms uh, 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 if you, because it's going to happen, right? So, if you were to, uh, you know, uh, uh, rescind on that contract, that's how I would think about contracts uh, that uh, that have that significant risk of uh, of uh, disruption because of domestic use. Um, the LNG market has, but when that's not the case, uh, the LNG market, I thought was, um, ha, uh, that was a lesson from Chile and Brazil. Um, so uh, because Chile had to diversify away from natural gas uh, from Argentina, it had to develop, uh, you know, overnight and uh, uh, LNG capacity, right? And so it was, uh, for Chile, it was extremely important to have security of supply. So it developed long-term contracts, uh, mostly from the U.S. Uh, Chile uh, uh, imports most of its uh, uh, LNG from the U.S. And, and to, to give you an idea, Latin America imports, uh, uh, you know, 40% of U.S. Uh, gas exports go to Latin America, mostly in the form of pipe uh, to Mexico, but also in terms of LNG. Um, um, so Chile has this long-term LNG contracts, very, very secure, uh, uh, in which Chile has that capability of saying, I'm not taking the contract when it has sufficient hydro, it doesn't need it, and so it can be sold. Um, Brazil and Argentina have developed an opposite view because it's, um, it is uh, cyclical. Um, it sometimes ha has to do with uh, climate and hydrology. Then they don't want to develop a long-term contracts because you have to pay for that. And so, and so what they do is that go in the spot market. It, and so what happened to Brazil in 2021 is that it ended up uh, uh, incurring a sig significant cost. So one thing to think about in Latin America when you have these kinds of issues um, has to do with: uh, Do you want long-term contracts or do you want short-term contracts? And just take the uh, risk of uh, market risk uh, uh, linked to uh, hydrology. Uh, but, uh, but there are already, um, uh, uh, I think the market has been moving into creating flexible contracts that are allowing for disruptions and, uh, and changes in destination. Martin? Uh, thank you, uh, good questions. So uh, Luis already addressed uh, at least a couple of them. Um, just speaking up on, on David's question, uh, complementing um, Luisa's response. Uh, so I was thinking in principle that there are two main reasons why rules uh, change at the domestic level. One is the macro, the macro inconsistencies, get relief and then 
that's the problem of the macro instability in the region. It simply, it becomes impossible at times to fulfill the rules. So that's a macro problem. And the other is a change in, it's the, the politics, but we're, we will of course have alternating governments, right? And that's what we want. We want uh, a, a well-performing uh, democracy. So I, I mean, it's not, there is no space for massive changes all of a sudden in terms of the percent. And you could tell us because you, from your side, you could tell us whether you see any path to massive changes in perceptions about the stability of the rules. So the, the continent, we have to deal with this. Again, every country is different. But uh, this is the problem we have. We will have to decide. The point here is that we will have to define policies, economic programs, accepting those realities, and improving some aspects of the definition of rules at times involving Congress may make a difference for certain issues that could become state policy. Uh, Jana, on the industrial policy models, uh, certainly. Uh, the policies that work in South Korea, in the East Asian countries in the 50s, uh, they wouldn't work today. Uh, any uh, strategy for economic development has to achieve three conditions. It has to create jobs. I mean, it has to be inclusive. Uh, it has to um, create foreign exchange revenues such that we have macroeconomic stability and it has to create uh, spillovers in the sense that we get economic dynamism, intertemporal spillovers. And what Korea could do with the development of the manufacturing sector, clear, certainly Argentina can't do it now. Uh, so you're not gonna compete with uh, Adidas producing shoes in Germany, uh, she's from Germany, uh, with robots. So you cannot replicate those strategies. So that's why it's so important to have an evolution of the views for industrial policies and some of the elements that we provided uh, today uh, uh, intend to go in that direction. And, and finally, uh, uh, Luciana's question, uh, I mean, the reality is that we, we live in a, in a war, in a globalization in which you know, there are, it's different than before. It's not that there is a deglobalization. De data doesn't tell us that there is a reduction in trade flows uh, and investment flows, but we have a different globalization, a globalization by blocks, and the different countries in the region will have to integrate themselves, dealing with the different blocks. And these relations are all important. And when it comes to the payment system, there is a perception by many that uh, the, the pre-war in Ukraine uh, payment, international payment system is not resilient. We know that there are economies of scale from an international payment system. Uh, there are network effects, but it could be also that all of a sudden you, you get uh, um, excluded from a particular payment system. So this creates a lot of questions for policymakers in the region. Mauricio? Well, thanks. Um, just to touch briefly on, on a couple of the points that were mentioned. Um, the, the growth model, which I think is a great question, um, in some ranks in Latin America has been interpreted as the need to start a new phase of degrowth. So the idea is that the energy transition or the climate transition better uh, will only occur if, the, if, if we go back, if we don't grow, if we have negative growth. Um, you may think I'm saying crazy things, but uh, lay, uh, take a look at the newspapers in Colombia and uh, you uh, you can read President Petro saying the energy minister is right when she says that uh, degrowth is one of the options, which in my view of things is uh, it's, it's not just a bad idea, it's an idea that uh, is uh, it's completely at odds with history, with the history of technological change that you can actually innovate, improve living standards and change the way you do things. And in this case, we can change the way in, we, in which we produce um, and um, um, without the cost in terms of, uh, of growth. Um, I 
I'm going to connect this with industrial policies, which was uh, which was a question that was made in the back. Um, so industrial policies require capacity on the part of the state, be it through subsidies or the government directly taking equity positions in companies or uh, you know tax credits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we have we don't have that capacity really. I mean, we cannot compete with the United States or Europe in that regard. So how are we going to do effective industrial policies with very limited resources? And also at the same time, how are we going to do this with um, this debate that we need to decarbonize very fast and maybe phase out oil and gas? Because this is part of the, of the uh, political agenda. So I think the only way out of this is to transform our state-owned enterprises, our national oil companies, into agents of this change. So why this? Because they have the resources, they have the capacity, and they'll have the political muscle to really tell governments, you know, we need to continue producing copper, we need to increase our production of lithium, we need to continue our, or explore more to produce more oil and more natural gas. And then they could be also, with those revenues, investors in the sense of these industrial policies. They could be the investors in the production of uh, of uh, electric uh, uh, of batteries or the production of uh, clean energy or you know so i think the political dynamics and the fiscal realities in my view point in the direction that the nocs soes are key agents of this transformation without them it's not it's not going to happen and on Brazil, on the role of uh, and what uh, President Lula said uh, in his recent visit. Well, Antonio Carlos Jovin, a very famous uh, Brazilian, used to say, Brazil is not for beginners. <laughs> so, you know, I, you, you, we have to be cautious about how to interpret what uh, Lula said. I, I, I have the impression that, uh, you know, Lula was making statements in, in Beijing that clearly uh, were not well received in Washington, that's very clear. And he was making the point, I'm here in Beijing, I'm strengthening my relationship with Beijing um, to take advantage of these opportunities and, 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 and become a player that is uh, that, 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 that has more room for maneuver. And I, I, I think this is, this is part of the game. Some of the things he said, I think are right. For example, when he said, the war in Ukraine has to start has to end with a negotiation, and uh, and and the negotiation will will happen. This may be ahead of his time, but the negotiation it's 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 the only way out of that conflict, as with any other conflict. So, my my sense is that he was there, um, um, elevating the status of <clears throat> Brazil of Latin America in the sense that. Uh, we're not fully aligned, to use the term that uh, Vicky used at the beginning. We're not aligned, and we are we're independent, and um, and we're going to set our own priorities. Whether this is going to be well, he said that in the first days of uh, in office, he went to Buenos Aires and said that there will be a common currency between Argentina and Brazil, which everyone thought it was it was a non-starter. But certainly, I mean, this is I, uh, this is the uh, the the rhetoric I think in 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 terms of what's happening. In Brazil now, if you ask me, and I'm going to make a comment on the uh, on the fact that Latin America has been shifted to the left. Yeah, that's true. That these leaders are, you know, more kind of like they they have in uh, they're becoming more in in more influential at the global level, or at least having a greater voice at the world level. Uh, President Petro had just last week uh, selected as one of the 100 leaders by Time Magazine. But at the same time, their societies, their countries are very divided. They won by a very small margin. So they also they also have that tension. So the, the, the things they're gonna be able to do is, is uh, relatively limited because the, the societies in which they're operating and Congresses reflect that are very divided. So. Don't let's not get too optimistic about the fact that these leaders are now having a, a kind of like a global voice 
because the local politics is going to anchor them to uh, to uh, a small room for change. Okay, so a couple more questions before okay. I have Christian and Magali there, and then a last one over there. Hello, thank you for being here. I, I'm Magali. I'm a first year MBA student uh, here at SIPA. And I, asked, I wanted to ask something regarding the political support or the importance of people's support that you mentioned, um, which of course I believe it's important since I believe in democracy. But for example, for example, everyone wants low tariffs, although they are uh, not sustainable and actually very harmful when they are broad based. And for both cases, Argentina and Colombia, how do you build the incentives uh, among political parties not to be tempted to follow this popular but unsustainable kind of policies? Christian, and let's try to be brief because we don't have much time. Hi, thank you all for coming. Uh, my question has to do with a few of the comments that Martin and Mauricio made, which is regarding the uh, new monetary regime with a lot of more monetary tightening. I wanted to know all of these projects that you guys are talking about um, requires a lot of investment. It's more expensive. What government capacities and in Luisa's experience as well, maybe private capacities, is there in order to try to implement all these things, given the rising costs of credit? I was curious if um, you can shed any experience on trying to navigate with uh, the resources at uh, the disposals of uh, these states. I can project. I'm Pernay, first year MBA student. Appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. Uh, I'm curious, going back to the beginning of uh, the introductions, of ge the geopolitics portion, America, both sides of the aisle, there's appetite to pay attention to China, to compete with China, that America's, the government's put money into that, they've created like the Development Finance Corporation, there, there's a lot of appetite both politically and, and financially, but it may not have, tra it hasn't really translated boots on the ground in Latin America into supporting projects like China has been. What is America missing? How can America connect the dots and be a better partner in Latin America? Okay, we have 10 minutes, so like about three minutes per person. Um, Martin, you start now. Okay. Um, so, Magali, the first question, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that, right? <laughs> uh, but... but uh, and it's prices. It's like prices of public services, what you're referring yeah. to, right? Not trade tariffs. Not subsidized tariffs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, th this is a problem for it. it, it uh, you, you don't want also to make, of course, energy unaffordable uh, to, to the people. That's why the, uh, the uh, and a strategy for the development of the energy sector is absolutely a, a priority. But uh, when you have three points of GDP, of your budget spent on uh, subsidies to energy, it basically means that the state has less capacity to do other things. And given the constraints that the state faces, it's important to define priorities. Uh, my view on this is that I rather invest more in knowledge and in public infrastructure that creates a dynamic comparative advantage and on this. Uh, when I was... Um, uh, the Minister of Economy of Argentina, uh, in a public presentation, I explained something that is important also from the political viewpoint, and of course it created some tensions, to put it mildly. Uh, mm -hmm. I said that the subsidies to energy were pro-rich. So if it's for the rich, that doesn't give you many votes. Uh, because at the end, what you need is the support of the people to your policies, and that requires leadership, that requires courage. Um, the question on the implications of the rising cost of credit, the, you know, again, we, we are in a different time now than pre-COVID-19 and pre-war in Ukraine. The increase in the interest rates and the quantitative tightening policies means that there is less liquidity and it's more expensive. And this may have heterogeneous implications, but certainly it will have implications 
for uh, the stability of uh, uh, private uh, capital flows in the region. So that's why I emphasize that um, the regional financing is so important. If you look at the data, what you see from on debt from 2008, th there's like a change in the, uh, in the slope at which debt grows in, in Latin American countries. But there's not just a change in the rate at which debts grow, but also a change in the compositions of debt. And private financing becomes relatively more important, meaning that it's a higher fraction. And we, one event that was important for thinking about the financing for development in the region is what happened in Brazil with a Lava Jato, the car wash. Uh, because that goes straight to it's, it's, a, it's a, goes to the problem of financing for infrastructure, and we are not seeing much change when it comes to the issue of financing for infrastructure at the regional level in the region, including from Brazil. We haven't seen really any significant change in the financing policies uh, for infrastructure in Brazil so far, at least. Uh, after the changing government, but, but that's one of the uh, uh, top uh, concerns for uh, policymakers in the region. What's going to happen with financing uh, this decade? And let me, let me Mauricio. So, uh... well, I'm going to make a quick reaction to that point, which is very important because uh, it basically touches a very obvious point that uh, with the current monetary policy and the current. I guess new normal, which is high interest rates, it was going to stay for for a while. I think now we look at what happened after 08 and 09 with the global financial crisis and the low zero interest rates that were kind of like in place between then and now as the exception, the normal, it's going to be uh, interest rates where they are now. And this means higher cost of capital for a transition that is very capital intensive and requires a lot of financing. So this will undermine the capacity of our countries to do this, to bring the solar panels, to bring the plants to produce uh, hydrogen, et cetera, et cetera. So how to go about this? At the same time, at the beginning, I said one of the problems, the starting points of Latin America is high debt, high public debt, as a result of the pandemic, as a result of the declining commodity prices, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you reconcile this? High debt, more costly debt, and more needs of financing. How, how are we going to um, uh, resolve that tension? I think we need to start being creative. And, uh, and topics that we are not seeing today as central to the conversation will become central. Um, you know, countries can take different types of action relative to high debt. They can say, well, we're not going to pay. I mean, Argentina has lots of experience with that. <laughs> we're not going to pay. And then costs come. And uh, and then you have these difficult negotiations, and but you pay a price for that, right? We may need to do something more more uh, market driven, friendly, uh, more part of cooperation, which is um, debt for nature swaps. We need to lower the level of debt, but we need to commit what we save to the climate transition. We need to make sure that the money we save, we're going to be investing in this transition. So things that did not seem part of the language of macroeconomists, uh, maybe for the last three years, we talked about this in the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s. When I was doing my PhD dissertation, these were topics that people were talking about, debt for nature swaps or uh, you know, debt forgiveness, et cetera, et cetera. We may need to bring back that agenda uh, because that's the only way in which we are going to square the circle, the circle to put it in, in our own jargon. Um, and I think that's, a, that's a, it's, a, it's a very important point. We need to study it. We need to think more about it. Let me just say one last comment. I know your point was about tariffs in the sense of the prices and the, um, of public utilities, but we did not touch on a very important aspect today which is the carbon border adjustment mechanisms, which is if we don't get our act together, we're not serious. Others will, 
and they'll impose tariffs on our products. So we need to start also at the same time, as so we're thinking about the debt for nature swaps, we need to start thinking about new trade agreements that prevent the goods from Latin America from paying these carbon border adjustment mechanisms or tariffs in the United in the European Union, et cetera. So my final, final point, uh, why is the US losing the game, so to speak, with, uh, with Latin America? Um, because we're talking about two very different economies, China and the US. So China has the state-owned enterprises that are the ones that go and invest and buy the public utilities in Latin America or are investing in the in the clean energies or building uh, 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 infrastructure, transportation, and has the banks that finance that. What does the US have? It has one instrument called the Development Finance Corporation, very limited, and essentially it's about guarantees. It's not necessarily about huge, huge lending. So um, it's also the, the US, because it's a market economy, it's at a disadvantage relative to the power that the Chinese government has, because it, all the tools of the state are being used uh, to push these, uh, these agendas. So something to think about in, in Washington, the way I transform this into something constructive is that I say the World Bank, the IDB, Mauricio. need more capital. And well, that's, have, otherwise, Luisa that's, won't that, have time. That's, uh, <laughs> that's something for the U.S. to do. Sorry. Um, very quickly, uh, financing the energy transition, the IA said, uh, will require that 70% of that will have to come from the private sector. In reality, the way I think uh, we should think about financing the energy transition in Latin America is what are the sources of financing? What are the tools that we have and the ones that we need to develop and for what? Um, in part of uh, what are the tools that we have and where the sources of finance are gonna come from, I do think that we have to be, as Marisa says, super creative. One of the ways in which we can be creative is how do we use our own balance sheet uh, to finance the energy transition, which already means that you are not taking currency risks. Uh, and uh, going back to the, the thing about ESG, why I like this framework um, is because it, companies have, to, in order to meet their ESG requirements, particularly on the environmental front, they have to deal with scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. What that means is that companies, in order to show that they're uh, uh, moving in that direction, have to use their own balance sheet, uh, either in the form of OPEX, CAPEX, uh, uh, and even diversifying their business models in order to reduce uh, scope one or, or scope two or scope three emissions. And that means that it is a way, even if you have foreign direct investment, even and if it's not coming in the way of uh, specifically in energy technology, companies themselves are financing and reducing their scope to emissions by themselves financing uh, 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 renewable electricity. That's how you do scope two. You, you need to decarbonize your sources of, uh, of energy uh, from a company perspective. So you finance uh, your own or you outsource your own electricity generation through renewables. So how do we use uh, for indirect investment, how do we use our own investments? How do we use our own development banks? How do we use the balance sheet of our government uh, in a way that is part of that uh, dynamic? Currently, 50% uh, of Latin, um, the financing of Latin America's energy transition comes from the public sector. Public sector understood as uh, uh, multilateral development banks develop uh, official uh, 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 kind of financing and uh, 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 state-owned companies. Uh, the other 50% is private sector, either in the form, form of loan, equity, all kinds. And so we have to understand that the financing of the energy transition is not going to come from one source. It has to come from for many, many different kinds of sources. And that means being very creative in the way we use those tools, including green bonds, sustainability linked bonds, carbon offsets, carbon markets, and ESG uh, as a way to use balance sheets of uh, companies. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot to Mauricio, Martin, and Luisa for a fantastic and very important conversation, I have to say. I learned a lot. Thanks a lot to the ILAS team, to Camila and Pedro, who were here and helped us put this together. And of course, thank to all of you for coming to this event. It has been a pleasure to share this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. I know.